right, today, top 20 fails, something we all do, uh, which is coral mounting and placement. How do we get this right for the future? Uh, I failed at this. I actually got a whole bunch going to my house today, so this is a good refresher for myself. Yeah. So, uh, starting with number one. Number one mistake is using the plug for a couple reasons. So, for some people, like the look of a plug on your rock work, it just takes off that whole, like the, it's natural rock and it's the shape of the rock. And now you have this round disc, perfectly round, right on top of it. It's just weird in there. But the other part is, uh, you know, the pests and algaes and things that could come on them. Uh, just take the plug off. Yeah. Uh, I'm one of those people. I can't stand the plug. I can't stand look. it day one <laughs> when I can see that little, uh, like porcelain or yeah. uh, the ceramic plug in there. I also, don't actually like it even after the coral grows over it because yeah. I can see that see little cylindrical base on it and I know what's underneath there. Yep. So pop it off not only just for uh, visual appeal but also because again like you said yeah. especially under LPS uh, frags there's all kinds of pests that hide underneath there. Pop it off uh, and then the glue and the epoxy will probably suffocate those little guys out. Uh, you get both of the benefits. Number two, this is probably a bigger issue than most people think. Yeah, the mistake here is not testing your PAR, getting some idea of the PAR in the different spots of your tank. You don't have to map out every single inch of it, but understanding you know, where those 200 to 350 ranges are for your SPS, understanding where that 75 to 150 ranges are for your softies, LPS, or lower light corals is probably the best way to save against mortality by putting it in the wrong place. And this doesn't mean like break out your PAR meter every time you want to put a coral in. Of course no. you could do that if you want, but like you said, like, you know, pick up the PAR meter, use it once, you know, and like map out the tank, yeah, right? Get some you know? idea. And you can get an idea, yeah, where the zones are in the tank. And so that like you can instinctively put the corals in, in the right area. So when you're mounting the coral, you are definitely creating, putting in an area where, you know, its habitat is going to support its energy <laughs> needs either by, you know, burning it or providing enough or not enough. So, you know, avoid all the mortalities by putting the coral in the right zone. Number three, I guess we're going to drive it home. Yeah, again, the mistake here is all about par and not knowing where. And this mistake is mounting like a 300 par type coral, like an acropora or what have you, right next to a 75 uh, loving uh, coral like your zoanthids or something like that. Just yeah. doesn't work. People will do it all the time. It seems obvious, but you'll see it all the time. Somebody will put an acro right here and then just six inches to the right but like a trumpet coral or something, yeah. you know, something that, you know, really doesn't require the same amount of light. In fact, doesn't like that Very amount of light. Far apart. Yeah. yeah, and so, you know, make sure that you're thinking about this uh, when you're putting it in. Like, uh, you know, I don't know you want a mixed tank, but two corals that are 300 to 75 right next to each other, it's gonna be difficult to achieve. Item right, number four, some people will say this is blasphemy. Yeah, the mistake here is using standard epoxy for your coral mounting. And I've used a bunch of them, the gray stuff, the purple stuff. It, it winds up flaking off and underwater and you gotta use a whole bunch of it. Uh, probably works well in dry conditions when you let it cure outside of the tank, like if you were building rockscape or whatnot. But when it comes to frag, uh, mounting corals underwater, it just doesn't work for me. Yeah, I don't know. Can you make it work? Sure. Is it the mm. best solution? I don't think so. No, yeah. uh, and so the reason I don't like it is uh, on an established tank, the gray epoxy looks ugly. <laughs> on a, a less established tank with white rock, the purple it looks ugly. Yep. And it takes a really long time. And often Corlin doesn't even grow on it. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. so uh, I don't know. It's just not a good looking thing. And on top of that, it's really hard to get the corals to hold. So you push the coral, the, the epoxy in there, push the coral in, uh, and it just kind of wants to fall out because the stuff doesn't cure very fast. You end up using a lot of it in many cases, and it just looks awful. Uh, yeah. There are better options out there, uh, especially if you're only mounting a, a few corals at a, a time. Bits, yeah. Yeah, and so for my goal is to use as little as possible. Uh, and so the coral gum from Tunes, I, I believe this is actually just like a, a purple dental epoxy. Yeah, uh, is what it is. But it's soft, uh, it's malleable. It doesn't flake off. Yeah, it doesn't. Make make your skimmer go insane. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's still like a two-part epoxy where you mix it together, 
but it cures in like 90 seconds, right? Yeah. So you mush it together real fast, you push it in the hole, put the coral in it, and if you can hold it for, uh, you know, probably at that point, 30 seconds, done, right? <laughs> and it allows you to use a lot less of the material so that you just can't see that it's in there. Mm -hmm. Also, it's kind of permanently malleable. It's got like a little bit of a flex to it. So if I ever want to get it out, oh, usually yeah. I can use uh, one of these tools here and kind of dig it out and it'll come out in like one big chunk. Uh, instead of like where the, when the epoxy cures inside of there, yeah. it's done, man. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be that ugly purple forever. You're going to be chipping it out. But your, uh, your encrusting corals or your SPS eventually, you know, will ba uh, will base out over the mm -hmm. top of it and uh, you'll, you'll never see that it's there. And like you said, the smallest amount. So I'm gonna say that like the at first reference, this stuff looks like it's a lot more expensive because it is. Mm. But if I can use, you know, one fourth as much to get the job done, not only visually does it look good, uh, I don't know, the, the price actually starts to, you know, intersect <laughs> that, you know what, it, not only does the result better, but it lasts about the same amount of time, even though I'm using, uh, uh, or I'm paying a lot more. So yeah. uh, in the end, probably the price about the same and looks a lot better. Number five, viscosity matters. Yeah, so the mistake is not knowing what the thickest glue is. I mean, we've got so many glues out there. And if you go to the hardware store, there's some that are just runny and then there's gels and there's different thickness of gels. I always thought uh, that some like Paleo Bond or Jurassic uh, gel used to be, it was a very popular glue, but there's some thick ones out there that can you, you can really use underwater very well. We actually did a couple of investigates tests on uh, thickness of gels mm -hmm. and how fastly like they dry up or firm up. Yeah, so you can see actually like uh, we can make a little coil out of it and see how the height that you could get out of it yeah. as well as if how it fast fell. it kind of melted down. Yeah. So you can check out that investigates if you want. But uh, I will tell you right now, I, as of uh, I just did a whole bunch of coral mounting a couple weeks ago and I'm going to do a bunch a day. And if you're asking me which one I'm, I'm going to use, it's this IC gel. Yeah. Uh, yes, that the is BSI. over the BRS one, actually. <laughs> uh, don't tell anybody. Uh, you know, this one works really good, uh, especially it's mm -hmm. inex inexpensive. Yeah. You're going to use a lot of glue, but I got to be honest, man, this is the thickest gel that we sell which for me makes it uh, the most desirable. Mm. The only thing I'll say about this is if you use too much of it, it gets this weird kind of glossy look in the tank. Oh yeah, I did. This stuff will often thing. like frost over and it's kind of yep. hard to see. This one makes this like glassy yeah. look in it. It's almost so like a bubble. Different. It's almost like a bubble gets stuck underneath and then it's just the sheen uh, yeah. on top of it. So be careful how much you use, but if you're looking for the thickest glue, which means that it's gonna kind of hold it uh, the longest, as an alternative to uh, using epoxy, See, often you can fill up a little nook with uh, this type of glue and then push it in there and it'll cure fairly fast underwater. Not as fast as this by any means, yeah. not 30 seconds. But yeah, the thickest glue is definitely the ICE gel. Number six, this is what I'll be doing today. <laughs> The mistake here is not using the hybrid method. And this is uh, one that you introduced me to. That is the little bit of hybrid of some coral gum and the uh, super glue together make a solid bond won't go anywhere mm -hmm. so this is my favorite method of uh, mounting coral so uh, uh, hopefully some people <laughs> will use this and say ah oh, this is for me yeah uh, so basically what we'll do is use a small amount of uh, coral glue I'll find a little nook where I'm going to put the coral uh, we'll smush it up and then put a tiny mid amount of glue on the top then smoosh the coral into the epoxy, mm. put some super glue on the bottom, and then put it in place. And That's now I have sandwich. super glue uh, touching the rocks, touching the epoxy, touching the coral. Uh, the epoxy has melded into the shape of the mm. location. It is cured in 30 seconds and holds tight. <laughs> okay, here's the piece that I love the most. Yeah. At some point, uh, you know, maybe you have mortality, coral dies, and then I have to remove it, or you're just gonna move a coral. Well, I don't want to have to have this permanent purple gunk all over the rock. Oh, yeah. The cool part about putting that glue in there between the rock surface and the epoxy is it kind of creates a different type of bond that mm. holds like nothing, uh, no fish or flow or anything is going to bump it off. But with a little bit of effort, you can kind of snap it right out. Uh, it all comes out. Yeah, and it comes off clean. Like, so mm. you snap off the glue 
and the epoxy's off there. So you don't see any of that purple epoxy mm -hmm. on the rock at that point. So it's not only really, really awesome for getting the coral to stay where you want, having it be done in 30 seconds, but also if you ever need to remove it, it will come off. Number seven, I'm speaking to GSP people. I'm speaking to zoanthid people, <laughs> mushrooms. Yeah, the mistake is uh, not considering an island for those corals that spread. I've done it with, I've had it with mushrooms, just put them on the bottom of my rock work, next thing I know it's everywhere. Or one of the uh, biggest culprits of this is zania, pulsating zania. This stuff just kind of flies all over the place. Put it on a rock, out in the middle, out in kind of like this island in the sand, and then all of those corals that you don't want to spread across your rock work and take over can just have a happy little home out by itself. Yeah, so make sure when you're, you're thinking about like the growth pattern, because you might think it's cool to have zoanthids on your main rock structure. You won't when they're grown over all everything and they've <laughs> coated the whole thing. And you might've thought it was really cool when you're like, oh yeah, look at all the different colors of zoanthids. One of them wins every time uh, and will wipe out all the rest. You know, one of them will be the strongest strain of the whole thing and wipe out all the rest. So. Think about how you can create little islands for the different corals around, either in vertical structures or mm -hmm. even you know flatter structures like this one. Uh, but you know, create something cool to put the coral on so you don't regret when it takes over the tank. Number eight, the frag plug doesn't have to look like a little peg. Yeah, the mistake is not considering rock rubble as a frag plug. So, you know, we said in the mistake number one was using the plug because it's a perfect, you know, cylinder, or square, ceramic tile. Uh, but if you had your, if you made a plug out of just some crushed up Marco rock or reef saver rock or what have you, and then I put my core on that, I can almost put that thing anywhere in the tank and use that rock and it just kind of winds up being part of the tank. Yeah, so this is more about creating your own frags than it is yeah. a, about buying them because very few people will grow them on rock for some reason. Yeah. I don't know what that reason <laughs> may be, but uh, that's the natural reality of it is that if I had a little chunk of rubble, I can glue it to the rock and it'll just look, look like an extension of the rock mm. instead of like this you know, silly little peg. And the peg is really designed for egg crate yep. and you know, growing Frag corals racks. at scale, yeah. you know. Uh, you know, I gotta be honest though, you know, I'm not buying the coral, you know, just to grow it. Like I want it like to look, look aesthetically pleasing in the tank. Mm, so natural. I would pay a few bucks extra if you put it on a natural mount rather than a peg uh, or even moved it to there later. Right. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, so if you're doing them for yourself though and your friends, Grow them on natural little pieces of rock. Throw some rock in the sump so it's cured and yep. ready uh, and uh, has that natural biofilm on it. And you can put that in there and it will look much better in the future tank. Number nine, you could ruin this <laughs> in the first time you used it. Yeah, the mistake is using a bottle or a glue underwater. So uh, one of the first times I found out or I even thought of using glue underwater was uh, watching Ryan's video of mounting uh, uh, the 52 weeks and mounting corals. I see you squeezing this uh, tube of super glue underwater. I thought, huh, didn't even know you could do that. But when you attempt it with a bottle, the reverse suction, when you s let go of the bottle after you squeezed it, draws in water, ruins the whole thing. Yeah, it is impossible to create even pressure in a way that you never let up and suck water in. <laughs> I don't know why, but the bottles are actually the number one seller. Yeah. I, I have no idea why that is because, uh, and I'm talking about the Lillard bottle in this one, because, you know, again, when you're using it, you can, can't use it underwater. If you do, you'll squirt water in and ruin it. Mm. But honestly, it takes a, a decent amount of pressure to get it out. Yeah. Whereas uh, all of these little tubes here, Roll it up. you know, A, I squeeze it, there's no reverse pressure. So you can use it underwater. You can apply it right to where you want it in every case. I've used this uh, uh, on aquascapes many times when the water's already in there. Mm -hmm. So stack it and then take a pretty copious amount of glue and surround the connection points and it'll create not necessarily a bond between the two, but a structural mold that yeah. holds it uh, together. Uh, and so I've used this stuff underwater for both frags, uh, but also even out of water, just the fact I have way more control over what's happening here because it's not you know, shrinking and mm -hmm. increasing from pressure. So uh, my definite, uh, if you can't tell already, uh, preference <laughs> is the tube over the bottle, even though the bottle's the number one seller. Number 10, 
Uh, I have definitely done this. I'll probably do it again. Yeah. It's a big issue. Yeah, the mistake is not considering the shape of the coral. And this is, uh, I mean, corals from LPS all the way to all of your acros and branching ones. Uh, the difference between what a branching hammer versus a wall hammer and how that's going to grow and the shape that it's going to take. Uh, but specifically, the acros and the different shapes of the acros and their growth. Some of them are short, stubbish, and some of them are long. Some of them have the different uh, growth patterns to them, but you gotta be aware of it. Yeah, and the, the, the hard part is, is like, for some reason the vendors don't ever show what the adult size the adult, looks yeah. like. Yeah. They show you these little nubbins, uh, one inch uh, nubbins, uh, and like, you know, if you didn't know any better, that little nubbin of your FLO, you'd never know this was a tabling coral. Yeah, just gonna you know? plate out. It's gonna plate mm -hmm. out and shade everything underneath it, right? Uh, and you might not know that your red dragon is a, what they call a bottle brush, yeah. which is kind of like uh, sticks that kind of grow up together. Yeah, like a stem yeah. with a whole bunch of little guys coming off of it. Yeah, and then you have your branching coral, like your mm -hmm. green slimer that, mm -hmm. you know, eventually though, will start to shade and it goes really fast, yeah. right? Uh, so like thinking about all these things, whether it's plating, it's a bushy coral, a bottle brush coral, uh, all these different things, tabling mm -hmm. coral, uh, if you can find that out, then you can place that in ways that are intelligent in the future so that, you know, one of them doesn't end up killing the other one quite as often. Number 11, you know what? The description on these corals should dictate this better so that you know. Yeah, and the mistake is not considering the way you mount or where you mount corals that sting. Some of them have super long sweepers, some of them not so much. But uh, if I mount a, a coral right uh, with a super long sweeper, uh, I need to make sure that this radius around the coral uh, doesn't have anything else that's gonna be harmed by them sweeper tentacles. The biggest culprit for me on this one was Galaxia. And when it grew out to be this size, things around it were just being stung, retracted, didn't look good. And just so you know, when we're talking sweepers, we're not talking about mm. just a normal little galaxia, coral polyps, mm. or a, yeah. you know, your torch polyps. Uh, we're talking about at night, the galaxia will let out these sweepers and they'll get really big and they'll kill anything that touches <laughs> it around it. Uh, so, you know, really uh, think about it. Like you can do a little bit of research about any of the corals you buy. Just uh, Google, does this thing have sweepers? And then you'll yeah. know. Yep. Uh, but if you haven't done that, go at night and you'll see the sweepers come out mm. at night. And uh, you can even turn the lights off a couple hours early if you don't want to stay up super late uh, and just come back a couple hours later, later with a flashlight yeah. and you'll be able to see the sweepers and say, oh man, that's pretty close to the other coral. And once to die, maybe I should mount it somewhere different. Number 12, this is actually the biggest reason for this. Yeah, so the uh, mistake is not considering a garden, you know, specifically for those corals that are known to damage or sting other corals. Why not just make a garden of all the types of corals that are similar so they can sting each other all day long, but they're actually not going to sting each other. Uh, but you're saving the rest of your corals and you get this really cool, diverse garden of similar types of corals. Yeah, so this is one of the secrets. If you watch those uh, like aquariums that are just wall to wall coral and you're like, mm. oh man, how do they do that? Yeah. The way they did it is by putting the same coral types next to each other in almost mm. every case, because most of these corals will kill each other. They uh, have been adapted <laughs> to fight for space on the reef and yeah. they will do anything they can to maintain its like little area of the reef. Uh, and so often though, they don't do that with very similar types of coral. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, they will still fight for space, but they won't actually poison each other in oh, the same way. That's like you, you feel like so you can hammers and torches together, you know, mm -hmm. you can put these thing, types of things together and they're just fine. Yeah, you can pack all your torches together. Mm -hmm. You can pack all of- your frog spawn. Uh, yeah, your and, A cans and yep. stuff together and they're not really gonna bother each other. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, uh, you mentioned this earlier already, but like hot tip, is it's really cool as well because you know your a can looks cool and this other variation of it looks cool but if i have them separated i just really don't get to see the variation when you put them together into these little garden areas uh, with euphilia yeah. and everything else you can see all the subtle shades and differences and really appreciate the breadth yeah. of how many different variations of this coral there really are when you start packing them in. It also allows you to you know, create that 
you know, ongoing part of the hobby where I can keep collecting because I haven't run out of space because I can pack so many more of the same mm. type of coral next to each other. So wall to wall, super epic, like showcase for coral, almost always because you created gardens and you don't have to worry about the stinging as much. Number 13, I'll be curious if we get some debate out of this because uh, <laughs> there isn't a one size rule uh, for everything, yep. but this is probably true. Yeah, so the mistake for us is not putting your fast growers at the bottom. And this is something that we see in the E170. I just called it out, you know, when you know when we were kind of talking about this video, is that bird's nest that's up on the top of the entire aquascape is a super fast grower. Those ponate bird's nests, you know, setosas, all these you know, different types of corals like that, they're fast growers, which means they take up a lot of prime real estate quickly before your acros can, uh, you know, kind of catch up and grow. So the mistake here is not thinking about that and putting them lower uh, in that less prime real estate and give your acros a chance up on top. Yeah, the big thing here is like shading. Of yeah. course, if you want to prune uh, and you don't want to grow up big, huge colonies, then uh, if you're Doesn't fragging matter. and pruning, probably this, this you can uh, just avoid this conversation entirely. But if you're going to grow up big corals, the ones that grow the fastest, you know, are, are going to shade all of the rest and overpower them. So when you have them at the bottom, they just don't affect all the corals that are above them. Mm -hmm. uh, and so having the slower growing uh, corals uh, mm -hmm. in the middle or near the top allows those things to grow without having to compete for uh, light and other resources uh, with those really fast growing corals like uh, the bird's nests and mm -hmm. uh, green slimers of the world. All right, number 14, think about the bigger picture. Yeah, the mistake is not mounting to the future and the, the, what you want the tank to look like down the road. You I mean, where you're thinking about, uh, you saw the, it's really beneficial if you can see the mother colony, you know, for the little frags that you get. But down the road, uh, if I have this staghorn that's, I know it's growth and it's going to go out kind of like this. And then I have a money cap and I know it's going to go like this. Um, you know, mounting that money cap where eventually I uh, want a shaded spot down below. That's a good place to put it. Uh, and for fragging too, I think, uh, considering like if you're going to frag these things, uh, where would you, would you mount them deep in the rock work where I can't get a chisel or something to them? Or would you mount them in a way that I can actually frag them easily? I think about this like a, a garden, plan the garden, mm. till the garden, work the garden, right? Uh, and so, uh, you know, you don't have to follow it exactly, but have an idea of where this tank is going to go and you'll yeah. probably reach it uh, if you uh, have an idea where it's going to go. If you don't, you're just throwing stuff in, probably won't. <laughs> uh, and the probably easiest way to do that is just Google reef tank and kind of find a reef tank that mm -hmm. you're like, you know what? I'd like it to look somewhat like this. And then you can start, you know, building the plan. I mean, I do that with my own garden in my own house, you know. Yeah. I, I actually have uh, no artistic uh, a bone in my body for gardening. But <laughs> I can emulate somebody else's success outside and pick the plants that they picked. Yeah. Uh, in fact, they have little plans for them. Yeah. And I'll just execute on the plan. So, you know, define where you are in the hobby and how you want to approach it. But if you have some kind of idea, you can mount those frags knowing not just where you are today, but where you're going as well. Number 15, uh, I have been guilty of this one even recently. <laughs> it's like where I want the coral and where it's actually going to thrive best can be different places. Yeah, so the mistake is not considering the flow. There's, uh, there's corals that like high flow, like your SPS, and there's corals that don't like high flow. So uh, depending on the flow and how you put it in your tank, uh, this applies to not only like catering to the corals and putting them in a way where they're the flow that they like, but also like future growth. Like if I'm putting a SPS colony in where it's going to go straight up and then eventually the power head's going to hit it straight, that's something I need to be aware of. Mm -hmm. So in my own tank, I have a bunch of euphilia on uh, one of the panes and I really, really just want them mm -hmm. there. That's where they're going to look the best. But it has been a challenge getting the right flow because they're getting pounded pretty hard. Yeah. Uh, and I've adjusted it and eventually I'll make it work. But you know what? Uh, really think about, you know, not always where you want it, but where it's going to thrive the best, uh, or at least know that if you put it where you want it and the current flow solution isn't working, you're going to have to adjust to it. Number 16, color theory. Yeah. The mistake is not thinking about color and putting corals in a way where you will have some like diversity of color. So uh, my first tank, I just haphazardly threw some corals in there because they look cool. 
And then, you know, later on when I actually started appreciating and uh, gained confidence in my ability to grow them, now I can place coral strategically where I get this mix of color. And what if I want an orange zone over here or a green zone over here or kind of a mix of blues, oranges, and greens? Uh, it's something to consider when you're planning out, you know, where you're putting these things. You know, I had this conversation with Nick the first time we shopped over oh. at Battle Corals. Uh, actually, we we're searching for, and, I, and I'm just picking every last coral that yeah. I think is uh, going to be awesome for the 160, right? Uh, and he's like, no, I don't know, man. We got enough blue ones. Let's yeah. get some red ones and some more ones. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he also had a really good grasp of, uh, you know, the uh, shape or the natural form was going to mm -hmm. be bottle brush mm -hmm. and tabling. And so... You know, really, you're curating this tank now using color theory. And so some of that color theory is cool from like Euphilia. I can get all the different colors of the Euphilia. And I wouldn't necessarily want to put all the same similar ones right next to each other. You kind of scatter them yeah. out or, you know, have a kind of a plan of uh, how you want to do it. But you know, think about color and diversity because it will be a much richer tank. 17, there's different ways to do this. Yeah, so the mistake here is not acclimating your corals or new corals to your lights. Uh, it's probably the, one of the most talked about is, you know, put them all at the bottom of the tank and then work their way up when you're ready to mount it for a few weeks. Most of the lights on the, in the industry now, though, have some acclimation mode. Yeah, this is a tough one because I, I, you know, if I had one frag to the tank, I don't want to turn on the acclimation mode right. and like bring down the lights for the entire uh, <laughs> tank. Uh, but uh, I, I think the best way is probably what you said first, yeah. which is just go find a lower light uh, area of the tank. And just for reference point, you are a hundred times more likely to kill it with too much light than you are not enough. Right. Uh, not enough, uh, it actually takes a pretty long time to starve the mm. coral out that way. Uh, but you can actually kill it overnight with too much yeah. light. So uh, yeah, you know, acclimate it in the way that you want. You can find little overhangs. You can put it on the bottom of the tank, work its way up. You could use the acclimation mode. I will say the acclimation mode is mostly for when you buy the brand yeah. new light and you're going to uh, switch over. I'm now going to run radions. Well, I don't really know. It will never really truly match what I was using before. So let's start low and acclimate up. 18. Number 18, this can be cool, but also not. Yeah, so the mistake here is not considering your bare bottom and the growth on it. This is something that we see you know, in a lot of the WWC tanks when we went and looked at them, uh, mostly for the purpose of they're putting like their encrusting corals down on the bare bottom of the tank which makes it easier to frag later. Uh, but you can see in the E170 where we've got, you know, Monty caps down on the bottom that are growing up the side or even uh, Monoporas that are kind of growing up the side. So, you know, just pay attention to, uh, you know, what is going to, how it's going to grow on the bottom and ways to uh, keep it contained. Yeah, you know, you might think that that's cool in the first day, and it, maybe it is, but uh, encrusting corals. Uh, I'm mm. looking at it right now in the 160 yeah, right here. here. It's grown up the glass, right? Which means that it's grown over the silicone, too. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the case of uh, the Reef Savvy tank, you know, the silicone has actually been removed on the inside, so you don't have to worry about yeah. damaging that, that, that little... I don't know what it is, sealed yeah. and, or on less expensive tanks. But, you know, I don't really want to mess with the silicone at all. So think about the corals around the bottom and, like, you know, make sure you place them in an area or actually maintain it in a way mm. that it doesn't grow up the glass because it becomes a big pain in the butt then. You can also think about totally different approaches, uh, putting little islands out there and yep. putting bottle brush or, or uh, bushy corals there instead. You get the same color on the bottom without encrusting and growing over every last surface. Number 19, if you got this type of coral, this is super important. Yeah, the mistake is uh, non-photosynthetic corals and not considering how you're going to feed them. Uh, a lot of us see like non-photosynthetic corals, if you're gonna, especially in a mixed reef tank or something, where you have them up underneath the, you, like you wanna put it in this dark cave up in the side, sideways or deep back in this, you know, where there's no light and things like that. Uh, but without considering you have, to, you have to feed these things later on. So making it easier for you to actually get to the mouths of these things and, and target feed them, uh, just don't make the mistake of putting them in a hard place to do that. 
Yeah, I mean, you nailed it. <laughs> uh, if you're going to have MPS corals that require direct feeding or anything you do want to direct feed, yeah, uh, you will do it almost anywhere for a week or a month. But if you want to care for these corals for years, you got to put it in a place that is easy or you probably won't do it. Number 20, sometimes you don't want to glue. Yeah, so the mistake is uh, gluing corals that have tissue on the bottom side or the tissue underneath them where you think you want to mount them. Uh, some of the biggest culprits like the fungi plates uh, don't want to glue the bottom of those. Uh, and, you know, sp specifically clams uh, may not be a coral, but it's the same thing. We're talking about mounting them here and you don't want to glue the bottom of a clam. <laughs> no, they have a foot. They'll yeah. do that themselves. And in fact, they'll move uh, themselves to places that they like in some cases. So yes, uh, make sure not to glue anything that doesn't want to be glued. Number 21, it can be fun. Yeah, so the mistake is not considering uh, using the coral growth patterns for something cool. Like uh, GSP is a big one that I see where people make, it looks like a field of grass on the bottom of the tank or even up the side of the tank. Uh, it's just got this green wavy looking grass. It's really cool in some cases if done right. And uh, some of the other coolest stuff I've seen is uh, taking like Cyphastria or these enc encrusting corals and putting them over like a, a skeleton head or some weird uh, structure inside the tank, it actually ends up looking really cool. Yeah, almost like kind of like uh, the uh, you know sunken treasure yeah. uh, <laughs> in, in the tank. It, it's not a coral like a reef, but like it's like almost it just grows over it and takes on the shape That's of whatever cool. was on. Yeah. yeah, so definitely very cool. So you can use coral growth patterns to your advantage and make it cool. All right, number twenty-two. And the mistake is not considering like more permanent frag racks. There's some frag racks like this Tunes uh, Coral Rack or some of these Reef Racks ones that you can actually put, yeah, add some de depth to your tank or another dimension to your tank, make this island in the top, uh, you know, in the back or the side of the tank, but it, it could stay there for, in, you know, inevitably. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, this is an awesome choice for just throwing a bunch of your zoanthid uh, frags in there. Mm -hmm. Let uh, them just played out on yeah. there in the different colors. Eventually one will probably take over, but in the meantime, you'll see them all spread out real cool. Uh, I actually have uh, built some of these own, these things uh, just using uh, rubble. I take a rock and break yeah. it up and then reassemble it using uh, the glue uh, and some uh, accelerator spray <laughs> and create my own little structures that I want to put frags on. Uh, they're sitting in my sump right now so that anytime I want to use them, I can just throw them into the tank and, and add these things on. So, you know, create some structures for the future, throw them in your sump so that they're cycled and ready, have that natural protective biofilm on there. Uh, and I think you'll be pretty happy in the future. All right, number 23, paying full price. As you know, <laughs> most of the people that watch these things in the first seven days get a good deal. Yeah. So 15% uh, off all the glues and epoxies. You can see that discount code over the community tab. If you're already subscribed, you probably popped up in your app already. Yep. Uh, but you can check out all of this stuff right here.